Hey people, thank you for stopping by Building Wealth with Rajiv. Palantir has been a mystery to many. Q4 earnings were very good. Stock since then has skyrocketed. I decode Palantir with Arnie. Arnie is a young investor and analyst based in Italy. He follows Palantir all the time. He's personally invested in Palantir. I hope this interview, this chat helps you with your AI and Palantir journey. So Arnie, your Palantir, you know, your passion. And My love. <laughs> why are you so passionate about Palantir? I would to say it's not only an investment, uh, it's uh, a path. A path for me to go from uh, what I was before, uh, an analyst, uh, to becoming an investor, which is uh, my dream. Uh, in my wild dreams, I seek to become uh, a top investor. But uh, how can you actually go there? Well, if uh, you are a chef, you're supposed to bake uh, top ranking uh, dishes. As an investor, if you want to become uh, a top investor, you need to, to perform and uh, show that performance over time so that uh, you can show actually there is a reasoning behind uh, what you're doing and you can't really say, oh, that's luck. So that is how I essentially started, uh, but it started from uh, an intuition. I was, uh, during COVID, I was studying uh, the tech, tech companies and uh, for me, it was something relatively new. Like everybody knows about uh, the big tech, but uh, I was not personally fully aware of the business dynamics of the big tech. I couldn't really grasp why they were so powerful because uh, before COVID, my, my attention as an investor was only in Italy. And in Italy, there are no big techs. There are like the excellent companies are industrial companies. Think of uh, Ferrari, Moncler. So excellent gems, uh, but are which are tiny and with a business that once set, they tend to go just just straight. With big tech, uh, tech uh, software platforms, like you need to sh change your mind. And when I saw Palantir was going to be listed, I get I got that tuition. Okay. I barely know this company. I can't really neither explain what this is, but uh, from the brief explanation I got uh, years ago from uh, the, the person who I was trying to build an investment holding with, he told me, look, uh, you know, you are used to think of uh, a business like an Excel model, but that is uh, two dimensional and is very rigid. Think of uh, a business as a series of boxes that are extremely connected each other so that uh, if you analyze how the money flows, like uh, how the water flows between uh, these, um, these boxes, then uh, you start understanding first how the business works, uh, but how you can optimize things. And uh, he told me, well, this company is not known, but he actually does this uh, to help companies and to target the terrorists. And I was, wow, like this must be a big tech one day. And then he went in the process of being listed. So that triggered my attention. And the fact that it was uh, called a black box, uh, that it was not really easy to understand. Like uh, I read everything I read on the S1 feeling. I read uh, almost everything, like any possible article that was online. And there was like this controversy is like, uh, some people love it, some people hate it. And the more I studied, the less I understood. <laughs> so that triggered me, okay, I need to know everything about this because I saw the opportunity of, if uh, my intuition is right, that this company has a special DNA backed by Peter Thiel. I'm a huge fan of his book, uh, From Zero to One. And if my intuition is right, then I could sit on a huge opportunity way before Many people will discover it. Peter Thiel says, uh, uh, the world of business is built on secrets, but also the world of investing is built on, uh, secrets. on secrets. When uh, you know the secret and the other people just don't realize it yet, you have a huge advantage. So um, I, I, I can say I got uh, obsessed with understanding this, but it took, it took uh, a lot of time. And initially I was studying just things on uh, my own because uh, there were just uh, YouTube uh, videos, but there was no, no, there were not a sense of, okay, I can talk with other people really 
what's around. I went through the meme uh, period, so I didn't felt uh, it was good to actually share too much on that. It's like, okay, this is dangerous. I don't really understand what's going on here. It's just yeah. wild. Yeah. But even now, I mean, look, I, as I told you that I read far more about Tesla and NVIDIA, but Palantir, I'm also very interested, but don't read so much. And I find co company, it's easy to understand in terms of business pillars, right? You have government, you have this, uh, Alex Karp is already always on YouTube, speaks his mind. So it's from that point of view, it's easy to understand. But how do you understand the products? Like uh... That was a big problem uh, mm -hmm. because... Uh... When, uh, once you start talking with other people, okay, what is Palantir? It's like, a, it's a black box. It's like, even software engineers from the Silicon Valley say, oh, this is a consultancy company. This is not a product company. Well, no. If you actually studied it, and it's more specifically, I think you can understand uh, Palantir, not from uh, thinking of the product, but thinking of what are the problems they solve. For instance, uh, Airbus had this production uh, hell <laughs> phase uh, where uh, they made the huge promises but they were not able to deliver the planes uh, they were supposed to deliver in time so how can you actually do that what i was saying before like once you understand uh, the business as a sort as an aggregate of boxes that are extremely connected and you try to optimize uh, each flow between the boxes that is where you start uh, unlocking efficiencies. And that is essentially what uh, Palantir did with uh, Airbus. Uh, they helped integrate all the data they had. So the corporate, but more importantly here, the production data, meaning that uh, they understood uh, the flow with these boxes to create uh, an aircraft. And they helped Airbus optimize uh, each flow between uh, the boxes. So by doing this, uh, Having uh, essentially one single plane of glass, you, once you integrate all that data, you start having an, a clear understanding of, okay, what's the current state of the plane? Because even answering this question without uh, one single plane of glass, it is the hell. Airbus has uh, so many employees uh, working in so many countries, uh, working with, from uh, many different facilities, but even asking, okay, how many days do I actually need left to build this plane is the hell. You can't really answer that question unless you have all the data integrated in one place. So that's the first part. But once you have uh, that, that intuition, that, uh, that monitor, let's call it monitor. In reality, they call it ontology because uh, ontology means uh, the state of uh, the being, meaning that uh, that uh, single representation represents the reality of your organization, department, uh, or maybe the entire company. So once you have that, you understand, okay, this is what I have. Once you have that, uh, you can optimize things according to your goal. And that's exactly what the Palantir did uh, to help uh, increase the, the production speed uh, of the Airbus uh, A350 um, by the, around 30%. So essentially with software, they helped solve the, an operating problem. But the most interesting stuff is that uh, this is a very vertical case. What Palantir does, since they have uh, this uh, software infrastructure, is that uh, they can solve uh, this in uh, the uh, airline uh, business, but they can solve potentially any business problem in any industry, being that government or uh, commercial. So. Now we are starting seeing uh, very big use cases uh, emerging uh, from uh, all industries. For instance, BP said uh, uh, they helped, uh, Palantir helped uh, reducing uh, the production cost uh, by a fraction. Imagine something uh, from $40 to extract a barrel to $16. How, and just by optimizing everything, you have uh, healthcare systems uh, becoming increasingly more efficient in uh, distributing pharmaceuticals. You have uh, now the NHS uh, reducing uh, the time uh, people spend at the hospital, the time uh, to actually schedule everything uh, from um, a, nurse, a nurse's perspective. So there is this uh, big question mark when, okay, but what is actually Palantir? And the big problem is, uh, is 
is that Palantir is essentially software to build whatever software that works in any industry. And if I tell you a definition like that, you say, oh, thanks, Evan, like that's the dream. But Just what Palantir does is- software. Exactly, so it's like, it seems too good to be true. That's the feedback I got. But on the other side, you have software engineers from Silicon Valley saying, this is a, a consultancy company. But when you actually look at these use cases, what uh, Palantir shares as an output, uh, and is that is um, that is then confirmed by the clients themselves, how they actually improved their operations, you see that, uh, okay, this, is, this can't be done by a consultancy company. And uh, you realize uh, that that is very powerful uh, software, which typically you would require tons uh, of uh, dedicated uh, software integrators, making a Frankenstein monster of many software solutions to have actually something that works. Okay. So I got these intuitions, but uh, the fact that uh, there we, we are now having a, a huge community around uh, the company makes it easier to actually have uh, these use cases emerge by spotting them on the web, having people who maybe use the platform, sharing their experience, tech people explaining why certain things uh, are actually a problem. So you see how in the, uh, how like um, the Tesla community, there is this crowdsourcing of ideas, perspective, experiences that uh, made the retail investors like me way more aware than the average professional on Wall Street. Yeah, true, true. So for us, the secret was unveiled, but they are just uh, discovering now, like after two years. Yeah. But tell me, Arnie, one thing. Uh, you know, the the Q4 was good, right? I think mm -hmm. the stock has gone up quite a bit after that, right? The last quarter uh, was very good. But if you look at year on year growth, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, like if you look at some other SaaS players, right? They're mm -hmm. growing like 30, 35, 40%, 45%. But Palantir is like still, what What was the year growth, yearly growth last year, 2023? Maybe about 20 or something? Around, uh, yes, around 20. Yeah, so, so, I mean, that's not like, that's not like, I mean, even, even Tesla, which is such a huge, big size company, I mean, uh, you know, so this growth number to me doesn't look very impressive. I know there could be underlying factors to it. Why? Because the it, the, the exponential growth might come in, as you said. It's not an Excel sheet, right? It's not a, it's not a two-dimensional world. What do you have to say to that? I understand uh, why there is a skepticism on the growth. But I have to say it is exactly because uh, I was first in line uh, trying to understand uh, what the mess uh, behind uh, the numbers. Because as you said... From a very superficial point of view, mm. it's easy. You see the revenues, you see the breakdown from government yeah. and commercial, and that's it. But trying to understand what creates the numbers, that is actually the tough part. Because for instance, the government side has its own dynamics. You have moments where the government side grows very, very fast. Like it happened during the COVID period. It was growing yeah. uh, like 40, 50%. 40, like, 50 wow. Yeah. And then uh, you have moments uh, where you say, oh, the government side is just there uh, lagging all the group uh, because they just grow around uh, 10%. Uh, what's that? Like uh, the business, the government business is now matured. Uh, who cares about that? Like uh, the top ranked analyst, Dan Ives, says uh, the government revenues, uh, the street uh, doesn't really want them. Uh, they don't pay, pay big dollars for that kind of revenues. Mm -hmm. But uh, the underlying reality is that uh, Palantir is uh, the top uh, software company in the government side. And the government side is uh, lumpy by nature. That is something that was underscored uh, in the first earnings calls. And that is something we just uh, need to deal with. We know that means that there will, there will be a period where Palantir achieves uh, a lot of uh, big uh, government contracts that help uh, the revenue grow. And the moments uh, where maybe the budgets are delayed, uh, they are working on big projects, uh, so they are increasing the influence, uh, but that is not uh, shown in uh, the results uh, yet. And that is exactly what I think it is happening right now in the government. For instance, uh, the fact that they are helping the Ukraine 
that was uh, a, a headwind in terms of numbers because uh, essentially Palantir provided software for mm. entire Ukraine for free. Mm. Now okay. for, for more than one year, which means uh, no direct revenues coming from that. But on the same time, by doing that, they are proving to the US government and to the entire world that their software actually works. And that becomes uh, like a, a super effective uh, marketing tool that uh, in a short period of time, it creates uh, a headwind because uh, you don't have a huge growth. But uh, if that actually works, as it seems uh, it is doing, that creates the basis for creating a very strong growth, uh, very strong trust uh, with the government side from uh, all the world, the, the Western world, which would become revenues, very sticky revenues uh, for the years to come. And this is just for the government side. So you see, behind a number that seems bad, if you understand the conditions, Mm -hmm. Then you start having a sense, oh, wait a second, this is a 10%, 15% growth, which is not exciting. But once you understand the context from a military side on the, on the non-military side, but still government, for instance, there are projects like the NHS deal that took a long time. Also there, there were a lot of software that, which was given for free, well, actually for $1 <laughs> for a lot of time. And then now they got this huge contract, which is the biggest contract uh, in the software space from the UK, which helps revolutionize the entire uh, health system. But, but wait, wait a second, having the trust of the NHS England actually unlocks also the trust uh, from commercial companies operating in the healthcare system. So once you have a client table with the NHS, the National Health Institute from the US, you start uh, aggregating the top hospitals in the US, then you can have a ripple effect in terms of brand recognition from all the minor players that are around in the healthcare commercial space. So also there in the commercial space, if you pay attention to the use cases unlocked, you see huge numbers in terms of 30% efficiency, 30% increase in sales, whatever. So it's like you see good output, you see these huge clients and still the revenues seems to be okay. It is growing, but there is this discrepancy from the value unlocked and the revenue growth. Yeah. What this means is that Palantir is not extracting all the benefits from the clients they serve because for them, the priority is exactly this, unlocking the biggest value they can they know that if a client is able to achieve these operating outputs, they will expand the usage of the platform. But once a client expands the usage of the platform, the, the, the more difficult and the less convenient is for them to actually go and change the platform. So essentially, if you look at what Palantir does, not only from a numerical standpoint, but more from what they're actually doing in terms of strategy, what you see on the surface is the growth that is there, but is still not extremely exciting. But uh, what they are actually doing is uh, planting all these seeds Please. in all the industries. On the surface, uh, they have an acceptable uh, growth rate, which is not exciting, but is acceptable. But in reality, they're creating all these seeds that in uh, three, five years, once these clients are mature, they unlock so many use cases, there you would see like a big exponential growth mm -hmm. because uh, the more the clients trust the platform, the more they can expand. And uh, if we look at uh, the existing customers, the top three customers of Palantir pay Palantir more than $100 million per year. The top 20 customers pay on average uh, more than $50 million per year. If we make a very raw comparison, that is way higher than even the biggest software companies in the world, like uh, Salesforce, uh, ServiceNow, their clients don't pay um, the platforms, so software, uh, ServiceNow and uh, Salesforce, these huge amounts. And these companies are Five, uh, four times uh, in the case of ServiceNow, Salesforce is 10 times bigger than Palantir. 
So if you have a tiny company like Palantir already having these huge clients and Palantir is just now focused on getting more clients, it is only a matter of time from my point of view, and that's actually my thesis, before all these seeds that are planted start becoming very strong revenue generators. At this point, Palantir doesn't have the incentive of maximizing the revenues per client in terms of uh, pricing power. It's like uh, they know they will have insane pricing power if they unlock value for their customers. Okay. So no, look, I, I look. Let me ask simple, uh, little controversial question. Not controversial, but Palantir is twenty years old, right? It's about twenty mm -hmm. years old company, right? Tesla is also twenty years old. Look at the difference. Uh, I'm, Tesla is also like 20 years old, not like 2004, 2005 it started, uh, or maybe 2003. I don't know the exact date, but uh, I'm reading Elon Musk's uh, biography also. So, but Tesla is what, like 15 times size of, uh, of, of Palantir. So, is it an execution risk? I mean, is there an execution problem with Palantir? That's what, because I think Tesla overpromises and Sometimes Elon, there's Elon's nature, right? But I think their execution is uh, ruthless and, you know, they do things ahead of time, if you see. But is Palantir uh, is good at execution? That's a big question. And that's a big question I also had for a long time. Because uh, as a personal, like from my personal experience, uh, I like to criticize uh, a lot when I see companies doing things, but also as a community, when we were discussing, okay, but what they're actually doing, we were also worried about this execution risk. And what you underscore is actually a fair critique. 20 years, uh, how you are not making a profit, like this a couple of years ago. If you are so good, uh, if you are so, why don't you grow 30, 50% while yeah, you are yeah. still here being yeah. relatively tiny? And uh, I thought about this uh, quite uh, a lot. And uh, there are many, many dynamics. The, the CEO, despite uh, they're both excellent, they're very, very different. Elon Musk uh, is a more entrepreneurial uh, character. He, he is uh, bro ruthless. And uh, once he sees the opportunity, he just uh, go and strike. Carp, on the other hand, uh, is way more uh, thinkful in what uh, he does. And uh, for instance, he says uh, he's passionate about uh, cross cutting uh, skiing. And once in an interview, he says, if you really want to excel in this discipline, you don't go and run fast every time. What is really important is that you run like a snail. You run like a snail for many, many hours with consistency. And then occasionally you go fast. And that's exactly what Palantir is actually doing. They built these tools thinking we don't need to monetize first. We need to solve the problems first, build the entire infrastructure first, and then we think of monetizing what we do at best. While with a car, uh, the monetization side is uh, more immediate, immediate. You create the car, you sell the car, and that moment you monetize the car. With software, things are different. You build this platform, you need to create the infrastructure to keep updating the platform. And the focus is, uh, do I actually solve a problem with my customer? And uh, can this platform keep solving new problems for this customer? So what they have done, they've done is uh, the for, for many years, like uh, three years, they neither had uh, a revenue. Like they were just focused on building a platform that could help uh, the CIA, the army actually solve uh, their problems. But then, uh, the, okay, you have a platform, how can you actually sell them? It's not uh, you go on the commercial market, uh, okay, this is the car, sell this car. With government, you need to understand how the government business works. And, uh, at the mo and uh, since they didn't have the experience, they were good at building software, they needed to understand how to play the government, uh, the government um, side. And uh, even the management says, we were so naive trying to 
sell to the government, oh, look, this is a good software product. It works eh? without really understanding uh, how you actually need to sell to these uh, customers, which is uh, very difficult because uh, the soldiers love the Palantir, but uh, the soldiers who are the users can't buy the product directly because the, the purchase is done by the Congress. So it's like there is this, this, this uh, mismatch between uh, where the, the product is used and uh, who purchases the product. And what you really need to do is to work on, the, on both sides. So you see, for instance, this dynamic alone uh, made the Palantir being very slow at the beginning. And then again, they were focused on unlocking the value to build the platforms that potentially could be used uh, during crisis. And that is also what happened uh, during uh, the COVID period. So since uh, the money was uh, free, Tesla used that to essentially uh, print a Gigafactory by issuing more shares, uh, using that money to build Gigafactory. Palantir was only focused on building software that could solve uh, potentially the biggest problems and by building the infrastructure to keep uh, building on new solutions. So for them, the free money era was we don't have to rush monetizing because uh, the money is free, so we are always uh, backed. But they also made mistakes. On the commercial side, they knew they were, uh, they were able to build uh, solutions like uh, uh, the database, uh, the databases uh, like uh, Snowflake. In an earnings call, you could see Alex Carp being frustrated for we completely missed the opportunity to commercialize something that well we already built uh, years before they went uh, wide widespread, and uh, he recognized it. We failed. We failed many times because we know we have a very strong product but we suck at actually selling this product. And that was a problem that I would say until last year was very there. Yeah. I was aware. I, the community I, I agree. Was aware. See, when I, Arne, when I hear Alex Karp, I really like him, right? He's, he's very American, right? In his approach. Well, let's bring our A game. Let's bring our B game. You know, he talks all those kind of language. And sometimes I kind of think that commercially, you know, uh, he's not a very astute thinker commercially. Like, for example, uh, you know, it's a very linear thinking. It's a, We are talking about a business, let's say exponential growth, but he thinks very linearly, right? Let's do this first, then do this, then do this, then do this. You know, so uh, his interviews also reflect this. So that that's, that's sometimes I think that, you know, a very driven uh, commercial-minded entrepreneur will do several things altogether. And monetization is top of the head, you know. That's a, that's the problem uh, with uh, here that was um, hard to understand. Is uh, does the management really want to monetize uh, what they do? It seems like uh, they have more fun <laughs> building software than actually yeah. running a company. Yeah. And uh, honestly, that was a worry I also had, but a worry that went away in this uh, last year. Okay. Not only when they. Uh, officialized, okay, now we care of profitability. Our clients want us to be profitable so that they can trust us more. But uh, from uh, a commercial perspective, like pure monetization perspective, finally, it we saw evidence from the claims. We build software that is uh, five years ahead, 10 years ahead with uh, the opportunity emerging from AI. What seems is like... Uh, Palantir has been, this, uh, has been building this uh, software infrastructure for 20 years by, by preparing themselves uh, for a big major way. Because the big problem Palantir had was uh, we know that our product is valuable, but our clients don't fully understand how valuable they are. So our sales uh, is very tough. Now with AI, everything changed uh, and the company needed to change completely. Previously, Palantir, in order to sell a product, to sell its platform, which by the way, initially was monolithic, so it was like a five or $10 million platform uh, per year, well, that was, and required like six or seven months of uh, pilots. That was a very, very, very tough- uh, Field cycle was very long. Long, uh, uh, tough, uh, and with a huge uh, risk of uh, 
client saying, okay, we're not interested. Now, with the interest in AI, companies realize, oh, I, this is powerful. I need to have AI in my company. Okay, great. But how can you actually do that and do that in an effective way that actually delivers uh, business value for your company? Well, what we said uh, previously, you need to have uh, that understanding of uh, what your company is, what are the boxes that uh, generate your company, and more importantly, what are the logics behind the flows between uh, the boxes, which is the ontology. So now everyone wants AI in their company, but Palantir has already built uh, this uh, software infrastructure to actually make sense of the data, to help optimize the data for uh, 20 years in any industry, and they needed to uh, change their go-to-market approach to actually reflect that. So with uh, this idea of the boot camps, Pantir was able to switch from uh, a six month period and uh, please uh, buy our software to a boot camp of uh, three, five days where a client comes with a problem. They build things uh, with uh, this new product, AIP, and they go home having solved a problem with uh, AI. With this means uh, that uh, the way they can close a deal increases exponentially. A client can taste the, pro the product directly, can taste the output. And what took uh, six months now takes uh, a couple of days. Yeah. So you see the entire company completely changed and the dynamic after this, uh, uh, this switched uh, completely also for in terms of financial numbers, because a six month pilot is extremely costly in terms of uh, cloud computing. Three, five days uh, bootcamp is uh, very cheap uh, and you can organize uh, or multiple bootcamps or you can organize a bootcamp with many clients altogether. The client has go home with an output while uh, many software companies promise the moon, but uh, after two years, uh, mm. <laughs> you have the certainty of the cost, uh, but no real output. And that translates into huge margins. So Palantir went from being uh, a trash in terms of uh, financial numbers, burning cash, so even free cash flow negative, to being free cash flow positive, this uh, before AI, and now with boot camps, they have a 35% free cash flow margin, which is insanely high while also growing. So the magic here is uh, typically when you spend more in growth, that comes uh, with a cost of uh, reducing margins. What we have been seeing in the last quarters is a company that by spending the same amount in marketing, but that marketing budgets being uh, deployed into making boot camps, which are extremely effective, Palantir is increasing the margins while also increasing the growth. And all these clients that now are able to acquire, in the last quarter, they acquired uh, almost 50 customers, which is way more than the 20, 30 they were used to take. And the trajectory is going to increase over time because this bootcamp acquisition process is very fast. And guess what? Once uh, they have all these seeds planted, it would take one, two years. And then you see the big use cases emerging, creating the revenue growth, which uh, we have intuition that should happen, but they have not materialized yet. So that's the big bet uh, I'm making as an investor and what uh, most of the community actually sees. The big difference with Tesla, Nvidia, and Palantir is that uh, once uh, Tesla and Nvidia have a product that people want, that becomes uh, re revenues immediately because you sell the car, okay. you sell the chip, uh, that becomes revenue. With Palantir, everything is translated over time, is diluted over time, but over time, uh, it can create uh, much more value. When you sell a car, you sell the car and that's it. Now there is also- a cash, It's kind of a cash business. You're saying that's immediate cash and- well, Exactly. Tell me, tell me Arne, uh, sorry to interrupt you. What is What are you looking out of your investment? I mean, I'm just curious. Uh, I think the, the stock when uh, it was when it got listed, it got listed at forty dollars, right? At uh, ten, well below ten, uh, but uh, it went. Uh, it stayed there in the ten 
uh, nine ten dollars for it was one that week. I thought it was forty two. It went up to forty two. The the all time. It high. went uh, well. It went to forty <laughs> in uh, the days after because okay. uh, one after well I experienced that uh, all of that. <laughs> and it was a wild experience because uh, I never had a situation like that. Used to okay. Italy, if you make 20, 30% in a year, you are already celebrate. With Palantir, I started a small position of 10K. And then after one month, uh, Cathy Wood started buying. Uh, it went to $14 and I was, wow, this is crazy. And then uh, the Wall Street Bets guys uh, from Reddit go went very aggressive okay. on the stock yeah. and then yeah. is where you had the meme period uh, where Palantir went from straight from $14 to almost $40 mm. <laughs> and that was complete madness honestly but what, but, what's, uh, your, what's your target on like we are 2024 beginning now and I know prediction is not easy but I'm sure if you're putting all your money in one stock or majority of your money in Palantir you would have certain expectation on size of the company and uh, the stock price also, right? Uh, which are related to certain to a good extent. What is that size in your mind for the company? How, how, where it's like? What what's the revenue right now? Uh, it's now is around the two two billion and some um, half. Yeah, two billion and a half, right? I mean, uh, so how far or where can it go? Let's say, uh, what was the growth rate you have in mind if you draw an exponential curve? Well, how far can it go is uh, the question that helps us understand. Uh, well, to answer that question, we should ask uh, where we are compared with the potential of uh, the yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if we follow what we just shared and we think that uh, Pantier is uh, not in the full maximization mode of the revenues, but they are in the planting the seed mode and each seed can become really valuable over time. So well, what we shared previously, the top 20 clients spend around 50 million, the top three spend around 100 million. And what's even more staggering is that this amount keeps growing by around 10% per year. So. If we look at it from uh, this perspective, uh, we see each client can become very valuable. Palantir is now acquiring many clients, which are at like day zero or day one. And that creates uh, a lot of potential. Now, will that potential be unlocked? Uh, well, that's uh, the bet. But what I see is uh, aligned with uh, what Alex Karp said uh, famously in the early days uh, since we listed, which was actually something that creates a lot of uh, hype. Uh, he said, I don't see any reason why this company can't be 20 times uh, bigger. And I agree with that. Now, from here to Palantir becoming uh, 20 times bigger, you need a lot of execution, which in the previous year was, uh, I would say, lagging, lacking. But now there is uh, like uh, what they are doing uh, with surfing this AI wave, uh, is the key to actually get to that uh, huge uh, numbers. Personally, I don't have uh, a target. I care to have the intuition that uh, this is a company that can become potentially a generational uh, company. I want Palantir to be my Coca-Cola for, uh, for Buffett. When uh, uh, Buffett bought Coca-Cola, it was uh, in the growth stage. It was not uh, a mature company. It was not... Uh, the Coca-Cola we have, uh, we are seeing right now. But what uh, he saw was, uh, okay, clients love it. They become uh, essentially recurring revenues because uh, Coca-Cola is addictive. And uh, in uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, this company will still have uh, the brand uh, and the brand will actually increase. And I don't think uh, Buffett, when he bought Coca-Cola, he focus too much, oh, in 10 years, the price will be this. He focused more on, okay, I have the intuition, the potential is uh, very big. And even if uh, they don't ex uh, execute at perfection, it would uh, make a lot of sense from an investment standpoint. That is how I try to approach it. I like uh, the conversation uh, around, uh, oh, what's your target price and whatever but I prefer to listen to them to, uh, rather than actually trying myself to think too much on 
the target price. I think uh, it is good to have intuition, but the reality is uh, I focus more on trying to understand what are the key drivers that could help the company having a sustained growth rate for, a, for at least 20%. Personally, I think 20% for the strength of a company is very low because I think there are a lot of conditions that make me think the sustainable growth rate is around 30%. So rather than focusing on the potential output, which is the target price, as an investor, I prefer to think, uh, okay, is the company trying to create the conditions so that uh, the growth rate stands, uh, tends to stay above uh, the 20%, ideally above uh, 30%? Okay, fine. Is the current price uh, implying a growth rate that is uh, too high compared uh, with uh, the underlying reality? Okay, if yes, then I can re think of reducing the position. If no, I'm happy to increase the position. And uh, before the earnings at 16, I went all in because I realized that the company was executing way better than the market was, uh, was doing. So I tend to be even more too active, but that's what I'm trying to build uh, as an investor. I'm trying to build uh, my skill so that uh, by knowing the company very well, I can recognize uh, these asymmetries between uh, what the market thinks, what I think, and what I think uh, should uh, theoretically be closer to the reality because I have uh, this compounded knowledge of over three years of maniacal study of the company. So to the short answer to your question is, uh, my target is uh, a no target, specific target is just a very big target because I have no like Carp said, I don't see reasons why Palantir should not become a $1 trillion company, a $10 billion, trillion company exceeding the big tech if they execute well. So since the big question is uh, the potential is there, but uh, the problem is on the execution, I try to focus all my effort in trying to understand how the execution is progressing rather than self-pleasuring myself with a target price on Excel. No, no, I, 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 have, uh... no, no, I appreciate that. And I think that's exactly, that's part of some thinking I have. Because what I think is that, uh, I think Tesla is not a fair comparison because uh, Tesla is a B2C business. It's a B2B business. and But NVIDIA is a B2B business, right? NVIDIA is a B2B business. And... It's a B2B, but you have uh, like a, once you, the, the customer wants the product and there is high demand, NVIDIA sells them immediately. So that's why we see NVIDIA yeah. like a going from this to boom, boom. Yeah, yeah, while yeah. with Palantir, that would never happen. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, I get that. Uh, but China is out for Palantir, right? They will never get access to China. They don't want to access China. I think their the whole mission is to make uh, US superior to China. Then they're supporting Israel. So Middle East is out for them. Uh, so, you know, I'm just trying to see the, what are the growth markets for them? Uh, is it, uh, US can't drive the growth alone, right? Well, uh, how many software companies there are in, uh, well, think this way. Palantir can get essentially all, I can't say almost uh, all the software market because that is impossible, but uh, the biggest markets for, um, for Palantir are those where you have big companies generating a lot of uh, like big numbers, but they are inefficient. Mm. So the US alone is already a huge market. Imagine to, to make a reference to uh, a company we all know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, the holding company of Buffett is uh, around $1 trillion conglomerate. Now, I don't know the precise number, but it doesn't matter. Mm. This conglomerate has uh, 86 companies inside that are operating businesses. These are all legacy companies. Each of these legacy company would benefit a lot from what Palantir sells. And not only. Now, right now, having AI is, uh, oh, this is cool. This is also cool to tell to my friends as a CEO <laughs> that I'm deploying uh, AI in my company. Also, also cool to tell that to investors in the earnings call. Okay, in five, 10 years from now, 
all these legacy companies, or they use AI to become competitive, or they will be destroyed. So even Buffett, which is used to a more traditional approach, and uh, he tends to have companies that are legacy companies that they, they don't tend to change. These companies need to change it, or at least adapt to the new world. Otherwise, you can't compete with uh, other companies. And uh, the big driver of uh, Palantir in uh, the next uh, five, 10 years is uh, exactly this, in my opinion, having legacy companies that need to be okay. driven by a tech infrastructure that is similar to what powers uh, Amazon, Tesla, and so on. Because if, th let's think this way. Amazon, Tesla, they're not really tech companies. They are reg legacy companies backed uh, by yes. tier one. Wait, wait a second. They are legacy companies operating in legacy sectors, but uh, they are software first. So essentially what they do is legacy, but uh, what uh, powers their business is software first. It is that software infrastructure that makes Tesla Tesla, that makes Amazon Amazon. But realistically, they, uh, they sell a service in the real world. The key difference, what they made uh, them different from all the other players is that every choice they make uh, is optimized and it keeps getting better. That doesn't really happen for legacy companies. So that creates a huge gap between the tech companies that are like, sorry, these uh, tech powered companies like uh, Amazon, in, well, NVIDIA is uh, different, uh, like um, Amazon, Tesla, Apple also, they all make decisions with uh, a clear understanding on what's the input, what's the output, uh, can I, how can I improve? Uh, while all tech uh, legacy companies can't do that, unless they have the same tools uh, of these uh, companies that now are all big tech companies. And Power and Palantir helps these legacy companies actually make sense of their data, optimize all the processes. So if you give uh, a, a railroad company the same tech stack of a big tech, this real company can actually improve their operations. And well, it can't be a big tech, okay? But uh, that's how it can survive and keep market shares from competitors. Yeah. Sorry if I digress a little bit, but think this way. What's, what are the problems Boeing is having right now? They are losing the reputation because uh, they had so many problems with the recent airlines and most of these problems could be solved by e efficient planning initially and then with effective monitoring afterwards. That is a software problem. And that's exactly the problem Palantir helps Airbus solving. And that's why we are seeing this divergence from Boeing making one mistake after a mistake and Airbus who rather than spending resources randomless or rewarding shareholders more than they should, they deployed the Palantir at scale. So now, after five, 10 years, this divergence is emerging. And I expect this divergence to keep emerging. So companies like uh, Berkshire, which are legacy companies, need a company like Palantir to help them have a tech stack, which is uh, a tier one tech stack that makes them competitive against the big tech. Otherwise, this big tech will take essentially everything. No, no, I get it. So last question to close, uh, Arnie, is where, what is your, do you have any beer, bearish uh, thesis on, in, on Palantir that will make you kind of uh, sell your stock or, you know, what's the worst case scenario you've anticipated for yourself? Like, for example, in Tesla, Elon is a key risk, right? Uh, it will definitely a big impact on stock price uh, in the short term or medium term at least. So what's that uh, key risk factor for you in Palantir? Well, uh, since we are talking uh, like uh, with Tesla about a company with a very strong uh, leader, I would say seeing uh, um, Alex Carr compromised with uh, his behavior, with his ideas, that would become a huge risk. Okay. So given the absolute weight CARP has in 
inspiring uh, the culture of the company. He calls uh, the company essentially a colon colony of artists. His role, especially now, is absolutely critical. So the biggest risk, uh, in my opinion, right now that the execution is in place is uh, on the carp figure, which I personally love as a character. I love uh, his uh, attitude and I love his thinking, but that could become a risk if uh, he starts getting distracted <laughs> like Elon, if something bad happens to him. And imagine this way, Carp was the very first CEO to go to Ukraine after the war broke out. Yeah. Carp is a brave, not only mentally, but also with his, uh, like, uh, his life, okay? And that actually becomes a huge risk because the more powerful Palantir becomes and the Palantir already has a lot of controversies. Think, uh, for instance, when they were getting the NHS contract, they had insane opposition from uh, um, activist uh, uh, groups uh, backed by the billionaire George Soros. But until they are activists, uh, okay, fine. But since they are helping Ukraine, they're helping Israel, and they're also helping uh, fighting uh, uh, crimes in the US and in Europe. Imagine how many people want CARP to be dead. So yeah. there's a huge, huge, huge risk yeah. here. Okay, I think Ani, thanks a lot. I think this discussion can go on and on. I have several questions, but I'll think I'll fix another time. Just keep the podcast to a manageable length. And thank you so uh, much for having me here. It was a great pleasure. No, I can see your passion for Parentium, and you are so passionate about the company. I'm you're spending a lot of time reading it, but so amazing. And thank you. Uh, have a good day in Italy. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye.